Thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm your host, Daniel Davis. Well, I'll tell you, there's a whole slew of ways out there that people can find themselves trying to lose weight. One of the most consistent things is watch the portions, watch what you eat, be sure to move, be sure to breathe, be sure to exercise. There's a big array of ways that people can find a way that they can actually try to find a way to get of losing weight and trying to become healthy. Joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program today is just one of those kind of people who lived a painful life of an overeater from her teen years and well into her adulthood. But about 30 years ago, she discovered the secret to regaining her power over food, but not through deprivation, but as a way to enjoy eating and lose weight anyway. She's going to talk with us today about that particular program and how its innovative ways have helped many, many people be able to lose weight while enjoy eating at the same time and also regain their personal power and health. I'd like to welcome to our program the author of the new book, Freedom from Food, and our guest today joining us on the Beyond 50 radio program, Patricia Bish. And Patricia, thank you for joining us here on the program today. Well, thank you. I'm excited to be here and uh, be speaking with you. Now, here's what's interesting about your book for the listeners out there. This is truly a your-mind-does-matter kind of a book. Yes, Yes, this is a this is a book that goes into a, a different mode because, as we all know, we've tried every diet there is. You know, we've tried to uh, exercise things off nu- uh, nutrition, carbohydrate diets. It, um, everyone has tried every diet, and if these diets worked, we would not have a problem. But the fact is that these diets don't work and that the weight comes laughing back at us as if it was waiting, just waiting for a cue to come back and actually bring more of its friends. (laughs) Isn't that always the truth? I think sometimes what gets frustrating for a lot of people when it comes to the mainstream message that's out there, usually find somebody wearing a tank top and a pair of shorts. You know, they've got some radical way about how you can get out there and move, and then pretty soon they try to move you into a direction of eating, and they suggest this is the kind of diet that you know is best for people losing weight. But the truth is, a lot of those programs seem to be a one size fits all, but they a lot of times don't fit for too much of anybody. That's really true. There is a perfect proportion that exists in everyone, and it's not about being twiggy. You know, there are twiggies here, or Paris Hilton's or uh, whatever, but if you look out in nature, which I always feel is our best guide, then you see all varieties of trees and each one, or flowers, and each one is as gorgeous as the next one. So some people may be a Sophia Loren. And no one can tell me that Sophia Loren or uh, someone like that isn't as gorgeous as Paris Hilton. You know, someone who is voluptuous, uh, that doesn't mean they are not as in perfect proportion as a Paris Hilton. So the key is to find our our individual beauty and proportion uh, rather than trying to fit into a mold and become anorexic and and, um, bulimic. It's trying to squeeze into a shoe. It's like the Cinderella story. You're squeezing into a shoe that was meant for Cinderella, and it's not meant uh, for a different size. Uh-huh. Now, what's interesting about the uh, freedom from food principles that you talk about in the book is that you connect and you start with how a person thinks, and you really start doing an archaeological dig, and that really creates some interesting insights as to what their behaviors are, especially when it comes around eating and food and diet and the like. And a lot of times people, I think, when they would look at something like this, think, well, this seems to be awfully different from what's really out there (laughs) trying to tell me what to do the right thing. Yes. Yes, I do know that it is very different. So I'm looking at... I'm looking at all these old beliefs that we've all collected. Eat this, don't eat that. Uh, You know, all the messages, um, do this, don't do that. And what I'm saying is, let's take off those lenses and put on a very new lens because those lenses don't work. And the lens I'm putting on is looking at our body, our natural blueprint of how we were born, what our body naturally does, and allowing it to... um, 
allowing it to create perfect health in the same way that uh, we have a homeostasis built into our body. We have a balance. So if we get sick and our temperature goes up, our, ba- our body naturally works to bring it back down to uh, the perfect temperature. So there is a regulator in our body about heat, about weight. And the funny part I found when I healed myself of this weight problem was that calories, which so many people, one belief is that calories will make you gain weight and how many of us have counted calories. Right. Uh, you know, I, I remember finding out that a candy bar was uh, only 100 calories at some point, so I put it in every kind of calorie counting I had, and I had a candy <laughs> bar every day. <laughs> and Another, like course, a recessed peanut butter cup to keep you going each day, right? That's right. <laughs> and, you know, thinking right, that wouldn't matter. It might not be the best thing for you, but it might. it doesn't matter in weight. Anyway, what I found out was when I looked it up in the dictionary, because I wanted to see what had happened to me, uh, I re- found out that calories, if you look in the dictionary, are heat units of energy. There is nothing in there that says anything about weight. So what I began to understand and put together how I healed myself was that my body naturally knew I wasn't hibernating and that these calories were heat units and that I didn't need extra heat and that my body would automatically eliminate it if I learned how to trust it. And and so I began to put forth a program which was based on Einstein's theory and based on how I lost weight, which was looking at food from a very different perspective. Looking at it, um, Einstein said everything was really energy. It was like bubbles of energy that was mostly empty space and that with our thoughts, we could move around, if you can picture like blowing bubbles and then blowing into those bubbles, how easily they go in any direction, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, well, that basically that our thoughts do that to the bubbles in a sense or to the energy that makes up our body, that makes up food, that makes up the whole world, that we have a power in us that we don't even know how strong it is and that we can find out and use it. I think what's fascinating, Patricia, is that you take a look at the fact that uh, this is something that you came into your own about 30 years ago now. Yeah. This is 2009, and for the listeners out there, 30 years ago, you roll that back, that way back clock there, you're starting to approach the 80s. Yes. Yeah. That's the era of Richard Simmons. Yes. And that's also the era of when a lot of people were jumping on that particular bandwagon of, you know, sweat the pounds away and, and, and screaming and yelling and making this whole thing seem to be like aerobics was the ultimate way to be able to, I guess, liberate ourselves from being overweight. But, you know, here's your message that 30 years ago people would say, are you out of your mind? Where did you come up with something like this? Yeah. What was the, uh, the the light that went on one day for you where this was the way you decided to go with what you're doing with your message, Freedom from Food? Well, I think that's great what you said because 30 years ago it it was. I was one of those people jumping, uh, you know, running to lose weight. I was... Mm-hmm. Um, I was dieting. Diet pills were big then. So I was taking diet pills. I was going, you know, on... There were people dying from those kinds of things, too, at the same time, just, you know, taking diet pills, as you're talking about. Yeah, they, they, they were dying, but we were desperate. We, we were looking for anything, as, they, as people still are. So after you do that for a number of years, um, and, and also... People who are my age um, have all other kinds of messages, not only about you better exercise, you better diet, but also that at a certain age, at a menopausal age, you are going to gain weight because that's, we have mes- beliefs that that's what happens to us, that at a certain age we will gain weight, that after pregnancy we will gain weight. We ha- um, our mother was heavy or got heavy later, and so will we. So we have all these messages, old beliefs that are in us that what happened to me is I was at the mercy of them. And I was studying how the mind affects the body. But, of course, it was just intellectual 
So I knew that the mind affected the body, but I was still in Overeaters Anonymous, try and doing diets and uh, binging and hating myself um, and, and taking off weight temporarily and it coming back. So what happened to me is that uh, I, my teacher said, come after class and I want you to try a different way. I want you to learn how to hold your consciousness in a certain way long enough, and I want to emphasize that because just an intellectual understanding does not does not access your body. But whole, learning to hold a consciousness or a focus long enough, at a certain point, the cells of your body begin to change, and that's what amazed me. For 30 years, what I found with people is if they, they learned, in which I have in my book, if they learned how to hold their thoughts long enough, and it's a very, you know, it's a very, uh, it's a formula, mm-hmm. uh, then what happens at a certain point, is the body begins to do what um, all, the secret that all thin people know. They know that the body will take the food they need, and they will it will release the rest. Mm-hmm. And all thin people know this. And there's thin people of any age. You know, uh, I, I I'm not a young person, so I knew. Um, so I know, and there's millions of people who are mm-hmm. thin and not young, and what they know is that when they take in food, uh, it goes right through them. And you go, how come you can do that? How come you can eat and eat and eat those desserts? Don't we all know thin people like that? Don't they, don't they annoy you? <laughs> and you go, I'm suffering. I just ate a cookie. I just looked at food, and I'm gaining weight. How do you do that? You know, it's really funny, Patricia, to bring up that particular point. I even know people myself uh, through a lifetime where it's it becomes sort of a playful joke. You could put, you know, a 10-pound roast in front of this individual, and they can eat just about anything there is in the kitchen. They never gain weight. But what's interesting about what we're talking about here is consciousness, conscious thinking, and, and that is that they reinforce the fact that no matter how much you eat, you're never going to get any bigger. You're always going to stay skinny. And and there's the key, you know, because of the way you think. It's true. And, you know, the thing is with these thin people, because they're in that flow, I want to call it a flow. I want to call it a trust of their body. Um, it's like the zone they go in, but it's the consciousness zone. Um, uh, people in their perfect proportion, that um, people can learn how to access and live there. And that's where I'm unique. Because what I'm doing is saying, you know, there's probably a time in your life when you were younger or you were in love or um, uh, you were on a vacation, you were a child, someplace. Maybe it was just for three days. You know, uh, maybe it was when you were in the womb. But there is... Uh, some time in your life when for some odd reason you ate whatever you wanted and didn't gain weight. And most people can come up with that week or that time. Do you have one? I Yeah, absolutely. I've got a lot of times that I can think to myself of exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. So, so, uh, pe- so what I'm doing is people at first think, oh, my God, she's out of her mind. What is she talking about? And then what I try and tell them is, I'm taking you back to something that's our, it's your blueprint. It's your right. It's just that it's kind of like in The Wizard of Oz when they, they didn't realize that they had the power always inside them to go back home. Mm-hmm. All they had to click their heels, think, there's no place like home, or to realize they always had a brain, they always had a heart, like the Tin Man, or the Scarecrow, and when they got, realized that consciousness, then they had the power to go back home. And that's really what I'm teaching people. And I'm, teach, I'm teaching them how to chore, choreograph their thinking long enough to, and how to put their attention strongly enough that all of a sudden the cells of their body start rearranging. You know, Patricia, I'm kind of curious. You know, as you take a look at a lot of diet books that are out there, one of the things you talked about just earlier was the fact that uh, there are ways that people suggest that you lose weight through counting calories. 
And as you take a look at the different programs that are kind of evolved from that premise, then you see where then pretty soon there's a workbook and you've got to write <laughs> down what you ate each day. And you think to yourself, why would I waste time in such mundane little details as counting my calories when, in fact, I don't see how it's really helping me very much? Because it seems like there is an amnesia. <laughs> you know, um, Einstein said, uh, doing the same thing over again and expecting a different result is what the definition of insanity is. Mm-hmm. And, but somehow, because, and I don't want to minimize it, because the reason people and myself did that for years is because we were desperate. You know, all eaters, someplace inside, there is a desperation. There is a feeling of separation, aloneness, uh, not feeling loved. There's some betrayal that has happened so deep in our hearts and there is such an anxiety and hurt and pain from that that we will do anything anything and that to to help us sedate that pain that anxiety whether uh, so people are reaching they're really reaching desperately um to uh heal this pain and comfort find the comfort that the outside world isn't providing and sometimes food is just that Food can be the comfort. Food that it can be a form of love. It can that we can't get outside, but we can give ourselves. Um, it can be a form of protection to have weight on you, so that you to uh, avoid uncomfortable uh, uncomfortable situations, glances, attention. So food provides us what um, what our let's say our own individual selves have have lost our way with. We don't know how to protect ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's the other thing, too. You talk about in your book how people will actually put on weight to protect themselves. And what's interesting about that is I remember watching a documentary in which a woman had had gained a, a fairly decent amount of what you could see that she was overweight, and her story went to the fact that she had actually been raped as a teenager. That's right. And through the years, from time to time, I have come across that sort of a story, and I thought, that's quite interesting, because if you thought of these women, and, and th- these are extreme circumstances, but that they actually were sexually very appealing, and then a trauma such as you know being raped happens, mm. they put on a lot of weight, and then they just kind of stay there. And so you talk about how people will put on layers of, let's say, fat or or just become obese or heavy to protect themselves. Now, why is that? And to give themselves love because if uh, what food actually does is, number one, it it sedates you. (laughs) Mm -hmm. In a sense, it it calms the system down temporarily before the self-loathing comes in. There is a moment, there are moments, I think uh, if you look at a drug addict or you look at an alcoholic or anything, you know, at first it it takes them out of the pain before the self-loathing comes in. Uh, So with food, it does the same. And when you have been abused, when you have been abused, there, you know, in your body, then you want to get out of your body. It's not fun in there. So uh, you don't want the attention that caused the abuse. And people who are abused blame themselves. Mm. There's a deep blaming in themselves, and that's where the disconnection happens. It's all about a deep disconnection from oneself, from others, and from uh, spirit. And so people disconnect from themselves. And and what weight does is says, look at You know, I don't know how to protect myself, and maybe I even caused this horrible abuse. So if I'm overweight, you won't look at me. Mm -hmm. So it is my protection because I don't know how to say, look it, go away. I don't know how to leave the room to say, I'm sorry, that is not okay. I don't know how not to blame myself um, or how to stop the abuse. Uh, and so at that point, what we do is the weight will do it for us. 
You know, mm-hmm. if we learn with our inner child and loving adult how to be have a strong loving adult who says, "Look at, take that attention and put it elsewhere," or don't even think of doing that. We get we develop a strong protector inside. If we develop that inside ourselves, then the weight can let go because we have a strong adult, a strong loving presence, and we're never too old to build that in ourselves. Mm-hmm. We always, it's the, it is always what we need to build. And then we have our own protection inside us, and weight doesn't have to do it for us. Mm-hmm. Patricia, earlier in the program, it was really quite uh, interesting that you were talking about body types, if you will, because each person has a body type that's very unique to them. What's important about maintaining a proper weight for whatever your body type may be, is really for health. I mean, you want good, vibrant health. And the reason I wanted to bring that up is I remember coming across a uh, a woman whose ethnicity was uh, Greek. And in Greece, and I guess even in Europe in general, it's considered to be respected when you see a robust person, so to speak. And that means that they may be a little slightly overweight, but generally it's considered uh, respected because this is somebody who's well-fed. And that being said, you can see that in a culture like that, they celebrate food as you know something that's very enjoyable, it's very pleasurable, versus the ideal of what we're talking about here at this moment of somebody in self-protection where they actually use food as a narcotic. And that's quite a different way of thinking. It sure is. You know, and the purpose of food, I believe, is to enjoy it. It Mm -hmm. really is. And uh, if you, you know, nature is our best guide. You know, it's the one thing that's not tampered with too much when we're in the wild, at least. And so if you look at trees and flowers, if you look at animals, you know, there are all different kinds of animals and, and all different kinds of flowers. And you would never go, oh, that animal is overweight because they have a perfect proportion. They're different. There are animals that uh, look really sleek. You know, there's rhino, rhinoceroses. They, <laughs> but they're perfect. You uh-huh. know, so you would never go, oh, that's a fat rhinoceros because if they're in the <laughs> wild, they're not fat. They're, so you understand what I'm saying? I there, really do. There is a perfect proportion, and they're sexy. You know, they're sexy in their own perfect proportion. So Mm -hmm. if we, what happens is we lose track of what perfect proportion is and we lose sight of what we are. So what I know is that if you learn to trust your body and you go back to have, um, go back to allowing your body, and I don't recommend doing this without going through, uh, the consciousness building that I talk about in my book. I really don't because you have to access your body properly with a gift you give yourself, a mindfulness that you do. You have to learn how to hold a consciousness. Um, But then your body will not take you any place that you're not supposed to go. It will, it will go to your peak look, your, your most beautiful self, because that's what you were born with. You're born with a perfect blueprint. I actually am thinner than I thought I would be, to tell you. But the truth is, in my childhood, I was thin. When I didn't, when before I had this problem, I was thin. I, I feel like I'm thinner than I really would think I would be. But I let my body dictate where I'm supposed to go. So uh, so that is what I want to say about perfect proportion. And I want to say with health, and it's so important, that when we take deprivation off, and that's why I teach people to learn how to eat whatever they want whenever they want it, to take good and bad off it and to look at it as energy, which is the quantum physics way, as fluctuating waves of energy, not good or bad which is a very different concept, and learn how to send that energy where you want it with the thoughts you think. So if you think everything I eat makes me lighter and lighter, well, that's very different than, oh, my God, you ate that cookie, or even if it's health food, you ate that avocado, and Mm -hmm. it's going right to your hips. See, I think that's what makes diets so miserable sometimes. Again, as I was alluding to earlier, you talk about the fact that, you know, there are programs out there where you have to count calories or there's a particular food that you have to eat. 
Uh, it could be, for instance, L.A. weight loss. You know, there's a whole slew of those kinds of things out there. But this is uh, getting back to being pure and simple about what is going on, uh, getting to the idea that your subconscious mind, uh, through its own level of thinking, creates the reality that your body becomes and that food just becomes a gateway for you to get there. And we have covered this many times on our program about the idea of communication uh, with your subconscious level so you can begin to see that what you think a lot of times you search outside of yourself for a reality that supports that way of thinking. So you could see just in that alone and what you've written in your book Freedom from Food is that you could go out there and you can run on the track, you can go out to the gym and you can pump all the weights, you can go and pick up programs and notebooks and count all the calories that you want to, but then you see people losing maybe some weight, but then within a week or a month or a couple of months it comes back and it just seems to be this volleyball that's going on with them. And you can see that getting back to the point of what you're talking about, of the way you think, you know, what are those... I guess, stories that you're rolling around in your mind can really prevent you from ever achieving those kinds of goals that you're ideally looking for. Yes, that's right. And they can be, they can be inhibitors, and until they're removed, you can stop the growth that wants to happen from your new ideas until you uh, remove those old beliefs enough so the new ideas that I'm talking about can grow. There is a reason that Olympic sports athletes use positive images for peak performance. There, there is a reason they all use it, because they all know this power of the subconscious mind you are talking about. And what happens at a certain point when someone develops um, the ability to put their attention in a certain place and their body begins to respond in that way, in the way that they want, when they cultivate that, what begins to happen is what I call advanced eating. And then when I can eat whatever I want, and you could feed me chocolate cake or you could feed me M&Ms or anything all day long and I can have it and it doesn't cause weight on me, then I begin to make healthy choices. And that's what I call advanced eating, which is, of course, our goal. Now I can make choices about what makes me feel better. I couldn't do that in the past. There was no choice. I was addicted to what I couldn't have. But now... I can I can choose foods that make me think clearer, that make me feel better, that make my body run smoother, that take away that help me not feel foggy in the morning. This is advanced eating. Mm-hmm. And so that is our goal, but it's not the goal through deprivation because deprivation only makes you feel want what you can't have. Well, not only that, but if you come from that point of view, Patricia, it's quite interesting that when the levee breaks, <laughs> you're going to go crazy. <laughs> That's it. That's it. The levee breaks, and look out, and you see it over again. You see it on television, these stars, mm-hmm. you know, who diet, 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 and boom, it's back. The levee broke, and it's back, and it's even more. The weight you know, is back more. Patricia, you bring up an interesting point. Even though we're running a little short on time, it's really interesting to point this out. You look at television, and there's this program called The Biggest Loser. (laughs) What is your impression with what they're doing on this program versus the way uh, you could see just a tremendous contrast here because just the title of the show alone seems that you're losing coming right out of the gate. But what is your impression of, of programs like that? You know, I think some of it is good and some of it I I, I think is sad. Uh-huh. Uh, I think that the sad part is the complete deprivation and um, and uh, and excessive exercising and the thought that this diet diet deprivation is going to be able to be maintained. The good part is they are helping people heal, heal their inner child. Mm-hmm. Heal that painful place. They are they are helping them exercise. It's just it's confused in there. So I I the sad part to me is that 
you know, maybe these people can exist in a deprived world and eat lettuce and, and, and avocado or whatever they eat. Yeah, we've all been on diets, grapefruit and protein and this. And maybe they can do that for a lifetime and how sad. But, but what, so I love um, the self-care. And so in my book I teach self-care because that's going to heal the inner child. The self-care, I have a CD set that where people have, the part of the CD set are these principles, but also is how to nurture the inner child and build that. So that's the part I like. But the part that I don't like is, um, is the deprivation. I don't like deprivation. I don't believe it works. If it worked, then the people who are who have invested millions on television, and we all know who I'm talking about, mm-hmm. millions have the best trainers, have the best cooks, have the best everything, have millions of dollars devoted to losing weight would be thin. Mm-hmm. It, it would work. They have the best of the best. It's not working. So so when these people, these celebrities, are trying everything they can and have ability to do anything that these shows do, you know, they can have right. every trainer they want, and they're still overweight. Mm-hmm. Well, There's look at Oprah Winfrey. Going. She seems to be one of those that, and it was really funny because... And was, I didn't uh, want to mention that, but <laughs> you are. <laughs> well, on. I am, so that makes me probably the culprit. But well, the point that I was making isn't so much that she seems to be on a, a, a again a teeter totter where you know she's losing weight, looking fit, and then all of a sudden it's coming back again. Yeah. But there was a show where she had a particular guest, and and it was really quite interesting that he was really at that time saying. To a relative degree, what you're talking about, it's what is your thought that compels you in that direction? What is the emotional trigger that compels you into that direction? And at that time, that seemed relatively so cutting edge that the audience, you could see for the most part, had a hard time grasping if they got it at all. And even she was kind of a little lost about the fact that he was saying, there's an emotional trigger, no matter what else you do, that trigger there is what gets you in that direction to be compelled to want something. Yeah. And, and, and that's where sort of the food is a narcotic sort of a situation comes in. Yes, the only thing I would say that's um, it's not enough. Mm-hmm. I, I think it's part of it, and I think that that's where I come in, in a, as a unique player mm-hmm. because uh, the emotional part, of course, without question. And I know that seems to be cutting edge. But there's people who go to therapy night and day mm-hmm. also and are still in the same place. So although it's part of it, it's to me it's not even the whole picture because the whole picture has to do with also understanding uh, what food really is, having a, a completely different relationship with food and what you see it as and seeing it uh, differently, having it go through your body differently. Um, so it, it, it's beyond the emotions because I've, I've had emotional. I've, when I lost my weight 30 years ago, I was in my 20s. If you think that I was emotionally developed, you are wrong. <laughs> you know, emotional development happens over years. So, <laughs> you know, I, I, we're all still emotionally developing. It's a lifetime process to be gently healing ourselves of wounds and pains that we have. It, 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 you can't do all that. I healed myself. I healed myself um Beyond that, although that's important and it's a part of the package, it's not the whole package. Mm-hmm. And so I believe that, um, yes, that, that, that healing your emotions is part of it. Then completely re-understanding food as an energy and how to, how to move it with your mind and how to work with your mind and emotions long enough that it actually accesses your body to go back to that place where you can eat and not gain weight. The secret that all people in their perfect proportion know. Well, I'd like to uh, let people know that uh, Freedom From Food, uh, as you take a look at the approach of what you write in between the covers, really begins to spill over into a lot of aspects of your life, so it actually does a lot more than just 
perhaps help you get to that weight or that ideal area that you're that you're meant to be and it's you know an, a very interesting book and it certainly uh will relieve people to know that you don't really have much of a journal for counting calories in there <laughs> yes <laughs> thank you it, it and uh and i do uh hope my wish is that it helps people because we we need a new way it, 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 you know it's been too much pain and we've tried the old ways and they haven't helped us. So we need a new way. We need to put on a new lens. We need so my wish is that people don't give up and that they open up to new ways which the the wonderful thing is now that quantum physics there's so much scientific evidence now that our thoughts and emotions um can and do affect our body and that there is an inherent perfection in our body that is there if we learn how to tap into it. The book is Freedom from Food, and our guest, Patricia Bish. Could you please give out a website where people can find out more information? Because I know that you do seminars as well, tele-seminars? Yes, on there are uh, seminars, are, are events. I'm going to be doing a lot of speaking. I am doing it. Uh, there's radio shows. There's videos. Um, and there's affirmation cards. There's uh, CDs. So please go to freedomfromfood.net. And remember, it's N-E-T, freedomfromfood.net. Uh, and... Uh, See if it see if it it touches home. I hope it takes you home, uh, home to yourself and to the natural way of eating inside of you. And what we won't find there is you wearing a tank top and a pair of 1970s shorts. I'm sure. Well, you're going to see. Uh, yes, you will see. <laughs> I'm not in the tank top, but I am. I am thin, and I didn't get there through any way but using the delicious, the delicious, the powerful. Uh, ability that we all have um, by focusing our mind. Especially if you can change those thoughts to you live to eat and you don't eat to live. And when you live to eat, boy, it sure is a lot of fun, isn't it? It it is wonderful fun (laughs) to have your body doing the work and, and what it's meant to do and having you be able to enjoy the food you eat. Very good. Well, Patricia Bish, thank you for joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program today. Again, the book is Freedom from Food. And go ahead and give your website out one more time. Yes, please go to freedomfromfood.net, freedomfromfood.net, to find out about events and and all kinds of things. Here are um, radio shows and videos and anything you will want to know is there. And you can sign up for consultations. I'm happy to help people uh, consult on this issue. Well, very good. Well, Patricia, again, thank you for joining us here on the program today. All right. Thank you for having me. I so enjoyed it. You bet. Again, folks, the book is Freedom From Food. As she said, go to freedomfromfood.com and find out more about this as well. I want to thank you for tuning in on the program. You've been listening to the Beyond 50 Radio program. And visit us at our website at Beyond 50 Radio. Dot com. That is the number 50 with a 5-0, and sign up for our free weekly e-newsletter. I want to thank you again for joining us. I'm Daniel Davis, and remember, live your day past halfway.